Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Ryan and Grant uh, with another episode of Grant Teach Me Something. Yeah. Uh, if you came out last night, quick thank you. We won't harp on that too much, but you know, it's harp, all. Harp. But you are a harper after <laughs> all. But anyway, but if you came out last night, <laughs> His thank last you so name much. Is harper. And, and, uh, thank you so much for coming out. It was a great event. Uh, we'll have another one on August 14th, but for those of you who don't care, um, real quick. If you're watching live, let us know who where you who you are, where you're from, where you're hailing from. I think that's right. Hailing. Yeah. So like what city, what state? Um, just so it's interesting. If you're watching replay later, do the same. Why the hell not? Right? Anyway, today on episode Is this the big 30? three O? <laughs> God. That's awesome, man. I know. Hey, I also want to know who our OGs are. I want to know like if you if you've been watching from since day 1. If you've watched any episodes. If you've watched ever. any episodes before, holla at your boy cuz I think that's fun too to know that. Um yeah, but you know, again, we don't want to harp, but yeah, y'all've missed out if you didn't go to the Propelio event it was yesterday. Raining. It was awesome. It didn't yeah, get out of. Get out of here. I had to carry a 50-inch TV and Uphill both ways in that rain. All right. So here's what we're talking about today. Yeah, let's, is let's, let's get back. You know, it's funny because we, you know, quick side note, we keep on talking about how much, how we hate the fluff, and here we are fluffing. Yeah, it's been like 10 minutes. Right. Anyway. Inter, inter, in, insurance. Can you tell we didn't sleep very much for this past couple of days? <laughs> insurance. Insurance on owner financed deals. Um, here's the thing is I've gotten a lot of comments on our previous videos over mm -hmm. this last week or so of people asking insurance questions. And admittedly, insurance is like the bane of our existence. Insurance, dealing with insurance, freaking sucks. It just does. Like literally dealing with insurance, dealing with banks, those are to the two like of my least, these are the two of my least favorite things. And, and one thing you need to keep in a point, keep in a point, fuck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We this didn't sleep. alcohol. We just no. We just got it. But neither one of us are insurance agents, mm -hmm. so neither one of us are coming at you at this in this dialogue at all about buy my policy. None of that. Right. So all of this is from a end user type of mindset of what you need to watch out for, uh -huh. what you need to be looking into. Yes. Mainly because everybody's like, what do I do for insurance? Right. And if you're buying houses subject to. Um, which I don't know which the episode numbers are and stuff, but if you're interested in sub two and that kind of stuff, make sure to look back on previous Grant Teach Me Something episodes. Uh, Propelio, which is tagged in here, you can look at the playlist and view, because we're gonna blow through a lot of that stuff, like subject two, owner financing, all those things. I'm just gonna kind of assume a basic knowledge of. Mm -hmm. But for those of you who don't have that basic knowledge, just to get a 15 second pitch out there of what it is, owner financing is an overarching term that includes many different strategies. One of those strategies is called subject two, which is a essentially taking over on people's payments. It means that you're gonna buy the house, you're gonna become the owner of the house, you're gonna take over on their payments, but you're not gonna move that loan out of their name, and then you're gonna turn around and rent it, or you're gonna turn around and sell it, or you're gonna turn around and do whatever the heck you want to do with it at that point in time. I like to do what's called a wraparound mortgage, which is another subsect Wrap of- donut. Owner finance thing, the owner financing umbrella of terms. Hashtag wrap donut. Wrap donut. Um, and with a with a wraparound mortgage, that means, hey, I bought it subject to, this is one example of it, I bought it subject to, took over on somebody's payments, took title, and then I've sold it to somebody with owner financing for a larger uh, amount, a larger interest rate. Essentially, my payment from coming in is going to be larger than the payment going out to that bank. Therefore, we make cash flow in the middle. So those are some like basic what you got to know for what we're talking about here because for the insurance to properly work in that scenario, you've got to do some very specific things or you risk triggering one of the biggest risks of doing this strategy, which is the due on sale clause. I knew that, but I didn't want to say it because I would look like stupid if it was wrong. You fancy. I know. And I actually I was, like, a, I was thinking about making you sit and answer it, but I was like, yeah, I'm not going to put them on blast I, just in you, case. Hey, this, that's what I'm here for. Put me on the spot. Put you on the spot. Um, well, real quick because we brought it up, uh -huh. why would that trigger a due on sale clause? Yeah, so due on sale clause, what due on sale clause is, and again, we talk about this in other episodes, so I'll give you the 15,000 foot view, because a lot of you may already understand this. Make but it 16,000. Due on sale clause is this thing that's in your mortgage. So moving on, <laughs> Okay, well, should we go into 15,000? All right, so due on sale clause, what it says is if you sell a property, okay, let's say uh, I'm Joe Homeowner, I own a property, I've got debt with Bank of America. If I am to sell that property, Bank of America has the right, not the obligation, but the right to ask for the remainder of my loan uh, balance to be due and payable at mm -hmm. any point in time after that. 
which means that if we're buying houses and we're taking over on payments and we're leaving that payment in place as is, um, they have every right to ask for that balance to get called and paid at any point in time thereafter. Now, now the going back does. to the insurance thing, is the reason it triggers it was because John Smith is the guy that has the mortgage. Well, John Smith is no longer on the insurance policy. Mm. Holy crap, we better get our money while we can before this mm -hmm. house burns down because there's no insurance. That is a very large reason as to why, yes, absolutely. So what we wanna do with our insurance policies is we wanna make sure that all the people that need to be named on that policy are named on that policy. Mm -hmm. Due on sale clauses very rarely get called in the real world. They can, it's a real, it's a real issue but they very rarely get called in the real world whenever those payments are being made. But one of the largest reasons that a due on sale clause is going to be called is that the insurance got screwed up and you didn't put the seller's name on there, okay? So here's one of the things that you need to, to be very aware of. And this is gonna be basically our, our foundation of how insurance needs to look. When you are buying a house subject to in other words, you're buying a house subject to the underlying lien staying in place. You're taking over on those payments. We're leaving Joe homeowner's name on the mortgage with Bank of America, but the title of the property is transferring over to us, the investor. We need to ensure that when we get insurance on that policy, Joe homeowner's name is still on that policy. Joe homeowner being the original? Being our seller. Okay. And thank you for pointing. So one, I will always use the same verbiage here. We will standardize this. I, I've standardized this in all of my uh, language and lingo. If I say seller, I'm talking about the person that sells the house to us. If I say buyer, I'm talking about the person that buys the house from us. Is that why you said Joe homeowner? Because that neither one of those. Works. Because neither one of those. Yeah, yeah. So it makes it really obvious, yeah. right? But I know that as I go forward, I'm going to say seller and buyer, and I want you guys to understand because you could, I could be like your seller, and you're like, yeah, 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 we're the seller. That's not what I mean. The person who sold the house to us, right. and then the buyer, yeah, 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 we bought the house. No, 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 <laughs> the person that bought the house from us. That's always gonna be the lingo. So yeah. our seller's name, in this case, Joe Homeowner, needs to, have, or needs to remain on that insurance policy because most mortgages are collecting taxes and insurance, which is called, what's that account? I didn't really think. Like, a, like an escrow, escrow account? account? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Yeah. Is it, could it be that easy? <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's uh, it. Uh, uh, escrow. The escrow account. The escrow account. So most mortgages are going to be collecting escrow. Not all of them, but most of them are going to be collecting escrow. So at Wells Fargo, Joe homeowner has a, has a, a, a bank loan and he's paying a thousand dollars a month. Well, some of that, 250 of that is going towards escrow, going towards the taxes and any mm -hmm. insurance. Well, when we are going to get insurance on this, on this property, we're going to replace the insurance policy that's in that escrow account. Okay? So somewhere in their computers, it's going to be like, wah, 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 mm -hmm. wah, wah. something's wrong, something's going on, something has changed because most likely, if nothing changes, it's a big bank, it's a big pol They don't care. Right. As long as they're getting their money and nothing changes, all's good. Yeah, and they're looking for, like, they're kind of having this automated, like, hey, right. does it meet this, does it meet this, does it meet this, but, we're but cool. But when, when the insurance changes and all of a sudden their money's changed, oh, 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 what, what, what? And they're starting to look at it. Yeah. So one of the things when we're doing subject two is we're not, because of the due on sale clause, we're trying to do everything that we can not to, like, flaunt it in front of them. Because, you know, if, if we go out and we're like, hey, check it out, your person sold this house, ha ha ha. Like they kind of have to call, it's forcing their hand. So mm -hmm. we want to do as much as we can to somewhat veil that transaction from the banks. Uh, not to say that there's anything illegal happening because there's absolutely not, especially like Texas Property Code literally has a section in the property code of how to buy houses with underlying liens in place. Like one of the common misconceptions, especially from realtors, because realtors have no idea, well, I shouldn't say this, we have so many great realtors. As a whole, realtors, have, a, have trouble thinking outside of the box. And they have been trained from the start that anything that they don't understand, they don't understand it's because it's It's not their illegal. fault, guys. It's not their fault. They're trained in this box. <laughs> yeah. And if it's outside of that box, it's because it's illegal. It's their defense mechanism. Right. It's, how, it's how the brokers retain alpha position, but retain that like, no, we are doing the only thing that is right. Well, if I don't understand it, that's because it's illegal and you can't Yeah, do that. that being said, there is a new generation that are way more investor savvy. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones you need to be networked with and have in your side And you pocket. find those guys at these meetups. I mean, Jay Lee is awesome. Jay Lee is the, the mm -hmm. broker of record, right, with uh, um, Propelio. 
does great things for investors. Uh, I've got great investor. You, you look at like uh, uh, Connor and Ian out there. They're doing the EXP thing, which I'm you know I'm neither speaking for or against on that. But like there is a whole wave of invest uh, of investor friendly real estate agents. But I want to be clear that when I'm saying we're kind of veiling this transaction from the bank, it's not because we're the seedy underground that's trying to get away with something that's illegal. It's just that we don't want to have to force that bank's hand. If you do stuff wrong in a way that's forcing that hand, then you're more likely to get that due on sale clause called. So we want, first and foremost, our seller's name to be on that policy. Mm -hmm. Now where that shows up is less important, but we do have a system of, what, of doing things in a certain manner that we have found historically uh, is going to be the most successful for you. And again, you know, as I, I, I don't, I don't always flaunt my my pedigree out here, but I've I've put out over seventy five million dollars worth of owner financed mortgages in this last six years. We've done wow. a lot. It's a lot of money. Thanks I'm for kidding. your sarcasm. I'm kidding. That's very, <laughs> I, we're very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, if for, so for my posturing statement there, all I'm saying is that we've done this a lot. It's not like I'm just like, hey, on these three deals, I've never gotten a do on sale clause called. Like this, this system that we do things is the way that it's like, this is how I, I get things done. Now you've got two different ways. But before we Please. go on, just so you know, because he just kind of flew through that, uh, what he just said is a huge thing you need okay. to un understand and have in that policy. To restate it, he was saying that the seller, the original seller, seller one, they need to be, whoever holds that mortgage in their name, they have to be on that policy. Mm -hmm. So regardless if they're involved, well, I got the deed, I got the deed, they have to be on that policy. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to put a little bit more weight behind well, it. Well, we're going, we will reiterate that point Well, I think it's a too, huge point. Yeah, it is. It is the most important part. And it's been a while since I've heard my voice. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> anyway, sorry, you were going to number two. Yes. <laughs> I'm a 10 year old kid. Um, okay, so there are two different ways that you can kind of handle the insurance. Now, one of those ways is getting yourself added to their existing insurance policy. That is the way that I least prefer. Um, one of the things that those of you who know me and have interacted with me over time, you understand that I'm a control freak, right? I'm a control freak uh, to a certain degree, but I think. I'm a warranted control freak. I think that there's a reason to be a control freak. I think you need to have control over your business and the way that things are happening. And uh, um, you know, there's a lot of negative reinforcement to these times that you do slip and let somebody else have control of a situation. Then you kind of get screwed up. If you are just added to the insurance policy that already exists, you do a lot of times lose a certain aspect of control on that scenario. And it's not always the best policy that you need to get for that. So while that is a very valid option, and that is something that you can do, and hey, I'm just a guy talking to a camera, so do whatever you're gonna do, that's not gonna be the option that I'm gonna encourage you to do. The option that I'm gonna encourage you to do is to get an entirely new policy, okay? Now, uh, the caveat there is if you're buying this house subject to, and you plan to wrap it in a week, maybe you get your name added to the underlying liens policy for that week, right? So that you're not having to replace the policy when you acquire it, and then your buyer, when they come in and buy it from you, is getting a whole new policy and replacing yours. That's a lot of spinning wheels for maybe not a lot of reason or results. So that, that might be one of those times that you would employ uh, getting added onto the strategy. But ultimately, when, when we talk about doing a wraparound mortgage, we want our wrap buyer to have paid for a one-year prepaid insurance policy that has all the names in the right place that starts from scratch and we are going to replace our seller's policy at Bank of America or Wells Fargo in their escrow account with this new policy. That's the way that I want us to go. And, and on that note, when you are shopping for policies, you want to make fine, make fine. You want to fine. make sure you find an agent that understands what you are doing, <clears throat> because just like the agent or the realtors, you know, they're used to mm -hmm. the box. And once you start throwing out subject to and wraps, if they're confused, go find somebody else. Right. For just so, you know, find somebody that they're like, yeah, 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 I got that. Yeah, I've done that, I've done that. If they're just complete, yeah, I understand what you're talking about, that's who you want. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you wanna make, uh, as an investor, you wanna get the cheapest policy ever, but you know what? Somebody who's confused versus somebody who knows what the hell they're doing, eh. That can't be overstated either. Yeah. And exactly, I love how you told them to vet people because that's so true. If you talk to that insurance agent, because agents are agents, right? Whether they want your business. They want your business. And so if you're like, yeah, I do wraparound mortgages, they're like, oh yeah, we can totally handle that. It's very different than like, I do wraps all the time, got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, 
every agent will be like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Google yeah. As they're turning around and trying to figure out what a wrap is. <clears throat> because here's the other thing is the majority of agencies out there literally cannot underwrite a wrap. There is, they are literally unable to, with their underwriters, create a policy that handles wrap mortgages. Hashtag wrap donut. So what we, <laughs> what we want is that person who really knows what's going on. Now, even in that realm, it can be difficult to find the right person. Um, but here's what you need when you're talking to your insurance policymaker. Here's what needs to happen. When you get that policy, and we're gonna take an example of acquired sub two, sold wrap, okay? Your wrap buyer, they need to come in with an, uh, an insurance policy that has their name as the named insured, your seller's name as the also insured, or it'll be listed as a additional insured. It depends on the insurance company. Some call it also, some call it additional. So buyer is named insured, seller is also insured. Then you're going to have a primary mortgagee clause. That primary mortgagee is going to be Wells Fargo, Bank of America, whoever first, the underlying lien The first is. lien. The first lien. And then you're going to have a secondary mortgagee, and that's gonna be your company's name, the company that acquired and sold this property. Those are the four things that you have to have on this policy to make sure that you've got a good policy for can, a rent. Can I throw in a uh, wrench? Please. Um, say you had to get private capital on this. Mm -hmm. So private capital actually, so are you um, uh, implying private capital with a wraparound in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm just or, saying. I'm sorry, with the subject too, or are you saying yeah, you got yeah, private yeah. capital to take it down? That's your first no, lien. No, 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 I'm saying you had you had the first lien, which is Wells Fargo. Uh -huh. You had to borrow money from, from your, your grandfather, your, your private capital person there, the second lien. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then would you then put your company as third lien? Yeah, so you can, right? Now, the, um, uh, it kind of depends on your lender, mm -hmm. on how they care about it going that way. But yeah, it's probably a good idea to do that. I will say that the majority of the time, I don't. Um, but I also know that my lenders are getting taken care of, right? right? You know, like if, if, if we do have a total loss, because the reason why this matters is the case of entire loss. Uh, and, and you know, fire, flood, blah, blah, tornado, blah, tornado, whatever popping in. You've got a total loss, you're getting everything paid off. We need to make sure that the liens are being paid off. Now, the reason why I don't, or I say that, you know, really not to put that, that uh, lender on there necessarily is that our mortgage holder, our buyer, has a mortgage with us, right? Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what they see. We know. And, and that's what primarily matters is because their policy, another bit of what we need is that we need their policy to cover a minimum of their loan amount with us. So that in that case of an entire loss, we're getting their entire loan balance paid off to us. Got it. And then out of that, you can take, you can make square. And out of that, we're squaring away the primary mortgage, the Wells Fargo and got our it, lender. Got it, got it, got it. The only reason we're really putting Wells Fargo on there is because Wells Fargo needs to see Wells Fargo on there in oh, order to not yeah, call yeah. that loan, right? Yeah. Our lenders don't necessarily. So our insurance policy with them is going to cover everybody that's involved. We've got liens right. situated there. I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to do our daily disclaimer of neither one of us are attorneys, so consult mm -hmm. your attorney. Neither mm -hmm. one of us are insurance agents, so consult your insurance agents. Neither one of us are financial planners, so consult your financial planners. This is for education. No, no, this is for entertainment, entertainment purposes, purposes only. Uh, that being said, get yourself a good mentor and subtle plug this guy. Uh, <laughs> subtle plug this guy. <laughs> uh, and, you know, to point you in the right direction. All, all I'm saying is make sure you have more information than just watch a stupid video with us up here. Make sure you trust but verify. Mm -hmm. That is a huge theme in real estate. So even though we are trying to give you as much knowledge as possible, that's great. But if you've watched any of our videos, you've noticed I've done a video recently saying that everybody's full of shit. So trust, but verify. Yes, anyway. that is great. I'm commenting right now. Um, I use an agent, his name's Victor Miranda, and he's not perfect, I'll be frank. You know, it, it's really, really hard to find insurance agents that can do this. I used to use somebody else that was great. She was expensive, but she sold her company and it turns out she sold it to Victor Miranda, who was the other agent that we were using. I commented on, um, <laughs> Oh my God. I commented on uh, there with Victor and his email address and let him know that uh, Fabiola or Jessica from Triple Equity sent you over. He's not going to know who I am because I never talk to the insurance 
people, it's always done through uh, through one of my staff members. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where uh, uh, where we go for most of our people. Now, the uh, back to the whole policy needs, right? If we're doing a insurance policy with our buyer, we want them to uh, have it a minimum of a minimum of our loan balance covered in that insurance policy. Now, we talked about the, the, the people, where they're needed. We want the uh, named insured as our buyer, the also insured as our seller, the primary mortgagee as our underlying bank, the secondary mortgagee as uh, our investment company. But we also need to make sure that our minimum coverage is our loan balance. And then finally, we need to make sure that, uh, well, I say we need to make sure, we need to look at is it an RCV or an ACV policy? And these are gonna be things that you as the investor get to determine how you want it to go, okay? So you as the investor get to decide if you are going to allow uh, whatever type of insurance policies. Let me actually step out just slightly and say that your buyer in a wraparound, your buyer when you're, they're getting a mortgage has a legal right to choose whichever insurance agent, whichever insurance policy, and whichever insurance company they want to use. Legally, you cannot say, you need to go to this insurance uh, agent to get insurance for my, for my deal. What you can say is like, hey, we've we used Victor a lot. He knows what's going on here. I recommend that you take a look at his policy, but you have a right to shop around and see whoever you wanna use, right? So we send him to Victor because he knows what's going on. Legally, what you have the right to do is refuse policies that don't meet your minimum requirements. Okay. So that's because the next thing I was going to ask is like, well, if you have all these stipulations of what needs to be mm -hmm. named on the policy, mm -hmm. how are you for? I mean, are you forcing them like, no, all this has to be on the policy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you need to have a written policy somewhere, like a written like internal policy somewhere that says these are the things that I want to see on an insurance policy so that you don't get hit with a discrimination suit. If some, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, it's never gonna happen, but let's be safe about it. Like if somebody was to get pissy that you've turned them down because of their insurance policy and say, well, they turned me down because whatever, I'm a guy and they don't like guys. Then you need to have a policy that says, this is why I turned you down and it's written. I had to be very is, careful is there. Is that digging my ex-girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> Confirm or deny. So, uh, so if you have a written policy that shows I need these named people listed, I need this minimum amount covered, and I want ACV or RCV, then you're set to say mm -hmm. like, look, I turned this policy down because it didn't meet these requirements and get that policy taken care of. Now, ACV and RCV, what does that mean? Do you have any idea what that means on, no. on insurance? ACV stands for actual cash value. Uh, uh, RCV sp stands for replacement cash value. Okay. So let's restate that and let's all write that down together. It's an important thing, yes. ACV. A C A C V. A C V. It stands for actual actual cash, cash value. Value. R C V stands for replacement. Oh, actually, I think it's cost. I'm sorry, it's cost. Replacement cost value. But it's still cash value at the top. Uh, no, both of them are actual cost. cost or cost value. Yeah, I think it's actual cost. Re value. Either way, that means the same thing. <laughs> You're like, I know is. Oh, I know I what know the is. difference is. I'm not necessarily if telling you. If you are watching this and Grant is wrong, just say, Grant, you are wrong. Grant is full of crap. No, it's cash. Okay, it is cash. Actual cash value, replacement cost Thank value. you, Team Google. Thank you, Team Google. So anyway, all of us, after we scratched all that out, let's <laughs> rewrite it. ACV stands for actual, actual cash, cash value. value. RCV stands for replacement cash Cosh value. Oh, it is cost. Yeah. Value. Okay. Yeah. RCV is replacement cost. ACV is uh, actual cash. So cool. the difference is, I think we all understand as investors what depreciation is, but let's just kind of give a brief overview of, hey, this roof got put on the house. We anticipate that this roof is going to last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me use easier numbers because I'm bad at math. We anticipate that this roof is going to last for 10 years and this roof cost uh, $10,000 to put on. Therefore, for every year of this roof's life, it is worth $1,000 less. Right. Right? That is how depreciation works. Because with the assumption after 30 years, you gotta replace the roof. Right, exactly. It is fully, it is worth nothing at the end of that time. So, ACV policies say, that was a $10,000 roof, we anticipated it to last 10 years, we are depreciating it over 10 years, therefore for every year that it exists, without a replacement, we're knocking $1,000 off of what we're going to give you if we have to replace it. 
So you're four years in, or let's say you're five years in, and a huge hailstorm runs through. Well, they will have depreciated five grand off of that roof, and they will say, okay, you've got to replace your roof. Here's the $5,000 that that roof was worth. Well, if it's a $10,000 roof, that means you got to come out of pocket with five grand. They, the insurance company just gave you five. You're going to have to come up with five to get a $10,000 roof put on Because that in their eyes, we well, already got $5,000 worth of use out of it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Even though in your mind, you're like, yeah, but it's my roof. I want the whole, give me I a new the, roof. Yeah, give me a new roof. What do I have insurance for? That is RCV. RCV says, I don't care how old it is. It's a $10,000 roof. We're going to give you $10,000 whenever that thing gets, gets replaced. Minus your deductible mm -hmm. on all of these. So... What we want, what I encourage you to get is an RCV policy. Now, RCV policies are going to be more expensive than an ACV policy is going to be. So what you'll find is a lot of times when you're selling with owner financed properties, if you're selling in that lower, like 25 to 50% of your median price kind of thing, you know, like here in Dallas right now, that's kind of that 80 to $150,000 house. The people buying those, those uh, houses, shopping for their insurance policy, I mean, shoot, we're investors. We buy houses all the time, and I guarantee you 95% of the people out there had no idea what the difference between an ACV and an RCV policy is. Heck no, this homeowner that's buying their first house, they're not going to have any idea what an ACV and an RCV policy does. What's insurance? What's insurance? And so what they're going to see is they're going to see a quote come in from their insurance agent that's cheaper, and they're going to say, okay, I'm covered for $180,000 here and this quote is $800 and that quote is $1,200, let's do the $800 one. But you as a lender get to say, I'm sorry, the reason why that one is so much cheaper is it's ACV, which means that if anything ever needed to be replaced, you're gonna have to come out of pocket a lot of money and we don't accept those policies. Mm -hmm. We want an RCV policy, which means that if anything has to, to be covered by insurance, they're gonna pay the entire amount and get it covered. So those are the big nuggets that you need taken care of on a wraparound insurance policy. Named insured, buyer. Also insured, seller. Primary mortgagee, seller's bank. Secondary mortgagee, investing company. You need the minimum coverage to be whatever the loan amount is with your buyer. Not the sales price, but the loan amount it has to get covered by that insurance policy. And you, I encourage you to require an RCV policy on these things to make sure that they're not having to come out of pocket huge amounts if there is a replacement there. And you also need to make sure you have your standard policy in place that you can gently nudge them in the right direction to get the right policy. Right, we can just tell them, hey, we've got really good luck with this guy. Uh, go talk to him, he'll get you taken care of, but you have the right to shop around. So those are, how, those are the technicalities of how we need to get it set up. Now, let's talk about <clears throat> what happens with insurance. Some of the crap that goes down with insurance once you've passed that point. And actually, you know what? So I just explained the most complicated version, which is the wrap. Let me just break it down just real quick for what if I wanted to buy it subject to and rent it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're gonna buy it subject to and rent it, you're just knocking out all of that side of the stuff that was on there. Everything else needs to stay the same. Still gotta get the, 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 the seller's info, the seller's bank info, Correct. and your info. And your info. So now you are the named insured, Mm -hmm. Your seller is the also insured. Your seller's bank is the primary mortgagee. That's all you need to buy subject to and rent it or buy subject to and, and obviously flip it. you don't need to give your own approval to get your own <laughs> right because it's your policy. But you are under the uh, under the, the um, uh, guidelines of the bank. Right. You know they get to they get to determine if they're accepting it or not. But I don't think most banks are not requiring ACV versus RCV kind of thing. The, like, their thing is mainly just the value. The value coverage. That's and, what we and they're named see. on it. Um, and that they're named, yeah, exactly. They wanna see the names in the right place. So that's, it's a much simpler version if you're just buying subject to and, and turning around and doing some other kind of exit strategy. Real quick, if you have questions, I, I know we're just kind of like flying through this stuff and I know it's kind of just like, some of it's obvious, some of it's not obvious and some of it's just like, do we really need want to talk about insurance? But you know, this is important stuff. So if you have questions, if you have comments, let us know. The whole point of Facebook Live is so we can have dialogue. Every time you look at us and we're doing this, it's because we're, we're going back and forth on the comment section, making sure that we take care of you guys. Which as a, isn't that cool? Yeah, technology. Like, isn't that cool that we have the technology to basically have a TV show where we're taking live yeah, comments and answer that? Next so we'll have cool. a 
You're on the air, live caller. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, but like I said, if you have comments, check it out. Also, um, if you haven't liked Propelio <laughs> or Creative Cashflow, their pages, uh, please like us on Facebook. Please share us. Uh, please watch more of our stuff. Uh, if you are an investor or getting involved to be an investor, check out Propelio.com. We've got uh, access to, to off-market lead lists. We've got uh, access to uh, MLS comps. You have access to uh, a deal finder with an MLS. Um, we also have investor websites. And very soon, I believe the release date is October 1st, oh. we're going to do the uh, Propelio Academy. We will have early release soon, so hit us up if you're interested in that. Um, but that's what we got going on at Propelio because we want to provide as much content as possible. Mm -hmm. But for the time being, you know, Give us some questions. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, let us know where you're calling from. We're calling from where you're hailing from. Uh, and even if you're watching the replay, we like to. We we literally monitor this stuff a lot. People are like, "Man, you're always on Facebook." I am. So. <laughs> yeah, yes, that is true. Anyway, I, I am always subtle on Facebook. plug real quick for Creative Cashflow. Yeah, CreativeCashflow.com. Uh, you know, I train on owner financing. As I mentioned before, I've done over seventy-five million dollars worth of owner finance mortgages in this last six years. I'm big in this market. I think it's the best investment model. I do fix and flips. I do wholesaling. I do rentals. If you've heard of it, I've done it. But I like owner financing. CreativeCashflow.com. I will teach you if you've never done anything before how you can start getting deals all the way to if you're super advanced and you want to do more. I mean, that's how me and Daniel Moore know each other is because he came to me to train him how to do owner financing. I like getting people to that next level. So check me out on creativecashflow.com. Do a live Q&A for all our students every Monday night. You've got an online academy where you can learn all the, uh, <laughs> the wonderful <laughs> rap, yeah! rap donut. I yeah! love it. That's so funny. It's my hashtag, baby. <laughs> rap donut. Anyways, get Okay, back so to let's the jump back in. All right, so... Um, Oh, Chris Walker got his free book. That's awesome. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the other, that's what you need to your insurance policy to look like. Well, how, how do things happen when you actually have to use that insurance? That's a whole separate part of the wonderful world of complicated owner financing. And I know you guys are watching all these videos. I mean, shoot, we got 30 episodes, woot woot, on owner financing and how to get this stuff done. There's a lot of complications to it, but that's because you make so much stinking money with it. It's yeah. worth all these these turning gears. And, and I'm glad we're going this route next just because insurance is not just another tax. It's not just, you're not just throwing a money away. You are buying a service and you need to keep that in mind that it, it's there for a reason. It's not just, because again, I think a lot of times you're like, man, I gotta spend so much money on my car insurance, my mm. health insurance. Mm. But then when you rack or then you have a heart attack, you're like, oh, good thing I have insurance. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that's where we're segueing. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, I mean, you've gotta have that I stuff had to dumb play. it down. <laughs> for me. Thank for you. For me. Um, so, you know, when that insurance claim occurs, it can be a pain in the butt. One of the most important parts of buying a subject to house is getting a POA for your seller, okay? Part of your contracting process when you acquire that property with owner financing with subject to, if you've got a subject to property, get a power of attorney for that property for that seller. Now, my closing documents that I use for subject to come through Horn and Associates, Scott Horn, who was a keynote speaker last night at the Propelio event. Um, you know, he's, he's been in this business for 35 years now, uh, really educated on that kind of stuff. And part of the contracting package that you will get on a subject to deal for that is going to include the power of attorney and the authorization to release information that you need to get a lot of this stuff done. Now in that power of attorney, if you were just going to go use a power of attorney and, and go against the better advice of using a, an attorney that really knows what the heck they're doing uh, about this stuff. Matt Acock is another great guy to talk to on these. Um, you need to make sure that you're in one of the sections, like in Texas, it's a, it's a promulgated form, the, the power of attorney is. It's, it's a, uh, all of them are, should be the same. In the second page, there's a paragraph that says that you can limit or extend the power of attorney. Limit that power of attorney to transactions dealing specifically with this property. And that's gonna be what gives your seller the comfort level of actually signing that thing for you. Mm -hmm. You know, anytime I present my uh, power of attorney to them, I'm like, look, this is a power of attorney so that I can make sure that once you've sold this house, you get to wipe your hands, not have to deal with any of this crap ever again. Granted, you've got your name on that mortgage and that's gonna keep hitting your credit and, and we understand there's still a liability there, but I don't want you to have to mess with this if, if at all possible. So with this POA, it gives me the ability to, to do anything that needs to happen with this house. And I wanna show you right here 
we are limiting this POA to only transactions that deal with this house. I don't need you to sign your life away. And, and, and real quick, let's do a quick hypothetical just to show you the power of this. Four years down the line, you need them, you need the sellers to sign something and you have no clue where they are. Changed their phone. They've changed they've their moved, phone, obviously. they've moved. Obvi yeah, they've, <laughs> I, you hope. <laughs> you hope they've you moved. You hope they're not squatting for four years. Yeah. Uh, no, but they've moved on. You don't, you haven't kept track of them because you don't hire employees that their only job is to make, because hopefully you're doing more than one house. <laughs> you don't have a dedicated employee to monitor where all these uh, sellers are going. Mm -hmm. So four years down the line, you need to get a signature and they're in, in Egypt or in Washington or whatever, you have no clue where they're and there's and you have no idea how to get a hold of them. That's why you gotta have people. And even if it's not four years down the line, I mean I have it happen Six how weeks. many times have you bought a house? And and guys, let's just be real here. We're gonna buy houses from people who oftentimes are just mentally not all there. Right? They're just they will hear everything, they will understand everything perfectly. You've got a great rapport, great relationship. And then they just all of a sudden forget everything that you've talked about six weeks later and they're mad because they are mad people. Like that's gonna happen. And so if that, if that relationship deteriorates, you need the ability to have control. Like I said, as long as you are in control, these th kind of things can't come to bite you. Real quick, I just, because what I just heard Grant saying, I wanna make sure everybody realizes Grant is not saying take advantage of mentally handicapped people <laughs> yeah, to steal oh, please, their houses. Please. Yeah, no, absolutely you know, you're, not. You're buying a house <laughs> when they have sound advisors, mm -hmm. people behind them, people around them that are giving them the sound advice to do yeah, this. Yeah, that, that probably came across. Yeah, early. I was what like, I'm, Grant. No, what, what are I'm you saying they're not mentally all there. What I mean is like the fact that people are people. Let yeah. me just put it that way. People are people. People decide to get mad over stuff. People decide that they have, you know, whatever, and we can't control that. When I'm saying mentally unstable or not all there, it's it's just purely because humans are humans and and crap happens and people's opinions change and they decide to forget or they, you know, whatever that well, might be. I mean, I'm not uh, saying another, anything yeah, 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 about yeah. intelligence. Yeah, and a quick another good example is, you know, that $20,000 they got when they walked away from the house. Yeah. Um, and they've already blown it on cocaine mm -hmm. and crack mm -hmm. and meth and now they need more money, guess what? That guy stole my house. Yep, and and like I literally, I'll have that happen. I'm like, do you not remember? I have one house in particular where this person is just, they're just mad, they're just mad all the time. And they're forgetting that they had a house that was 10% over market value, that was headed to foreclosure in four days, that I had to catch up like $13,000 worth of back payments on, and I gave them five grand to walk away, but they forget all that because now values have gone up. Right now, now the house is worth whatever sixty thousand dollars more than when they sold it to us, and they're mad that you know we we got their house from them. And it's like, do you not remember that you were going you were going to foreclosure, absolutely hopeless in four days, and we came in here and busted our butts to make this work for you, mm -hmm. and gave you money to walk away, even though you were ten percent over value. Right? I'm just saying that stuff happens. You got to be aware of it. One of the, re the, the soapbox moments, and we'll, I'll move on after this, I promise. One of my soapbox moments is um, the number one reason that people fail in this business is unrealistic expectations. Uh, whether that is I'm gonna be rich and retired in six months, or whether that is I'm going to have bought 10 houses in six months, whether that is, hey, subject two is the perfect solution for everybody and everybody's always gonna be happy about it and everybody's gonna understand it as much as I do. Unrealistic expectations can bite you in the butt. So what I'm trying to do here is be real about it. I'm not trying to act like every single one of my sellers has been super happy for the rest of the time. That would be insincere. That would be untrue. I have sellers that absolutely forget the favor that we did to them, to them, mm. for them, to help them get out of this situation and just get mad. But then again, I have sellers that are breaking down crying, thanking me for saving them out of this situation. And we've got buyers that are in houses that could have never bought their house before coming in, shaking our hand, thanking them for having a place. You know, there's both yeah. sides of the coin. And, Let's and, not ignore either and one and of them. I'd like to join you on the soapbox real quick because we, we touched on it briefly on Monday with Daniel and I because uh, we were just talking about mistakes that the wholesalers make. So if you haven't seen that video, uh, check out Monday's episode where we we literally, Daniel just goes straight through an assignment, uh, uh, a contract, an assignment. And what, we were talking about some of the mistakes and one of the mistakes is unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and getting into this real estate business and thinking, oh, it's gonna, you're just gonna blow it out of the water, blah, 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 blah. You know, and some of that unrealistic expectations comes from 
social media and choosing the wrong people as role models. The yeah. people are like, oh, I do this, I do this, I do a thousand this, I do a thousand that, and I've never lost this. So, you know I just, what I loved? I loved seeing Danny put up his check for four dollars and thirty-two cents the other day. Did you see that? <laughs> I saw. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, because, and and I'm using it as a positive example because as right. the, you know, there's so many people like Tim Harridge. I've mentioned this before. Came out a couple of weeks ago saying, "Look, I've gotten a check at the title company for two fifty, and I lost a hundred on that deal. Right? Like right. checks mean nothing. So yeah, but just to just to finish up that soapbox is just be careful. You know, people. Like before, people are people. People like to brag about stuff they don't need to be bragging about. But so, you know, trust but verify, have those realistic expectations and just be careful of who you're looking up to. Right. So back to this and whole- I, and, I, and, and on that said, I am not, I don't have any examples of who you shouldn't be. I'm just saying, be careful. <laughs> okay, so back to the power of attorney side. We get the power of attorney signed with our seller. Here's why, is in the event of a loss, when you've got a loss claim that occurs, that loss claim check is gonna come in from the insurance policy and it's gonna have everybody's freaking name on it. It's gonna have the primary mortgagee, it's gonna have the secondary mortgagee, it's gonna have the also insured, it's gonna have the named insured. So that means that you've gotta have four signatures on this check in order for it to cash, okay? So this is where part of that challenge comes in. Now, the reason why they do that is they wanna make sure that everybody understands there was a loss claim on this and that no one party is able to just cash a check and go to the strip club. We need to make sure that everything's getting done the right way, that the bank 